Hi, my name is Ronit, and with my partner in crime, Gaurav, we're delighted to host the latest edition of our FinTech and Web3 Founders podcast brought to you by CFTE. Haseeb, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Good to see you both. Uh, where, where in the world are you today, Haseeb? So I'm at home here in the States. Uh, I'm normally based on the West Coast, but uh, I, I've been traveling so much this year. I think I, I saw you when I was in Dubai just a couple months ago. Hello. Um, I, was in, I was in Singapore at the beginning of the year. I was in SF. I was in New York. Uh, so I've, I've, been, I've been traveling a lot this year, uh, and it's been a pretty wild year for it. Wow. Well, we're going to talk all about how the year's been shaping up and also your thoughts on the future of the world of crypto. But before we delve into that, for folks who don't know you very well, share a little bit about your background. Um, you famously used to play poker at quite a high level. And uh, from that, got into crypto and blockchain. And talk about that journey. Yeah. So uh, for those of you who weren't aware, I'm Haseeb. I'm a managing partner at Dragonfly, which is a global crypto fund. Um, before that, before I ever got into, before I really did anything professional, I used to be a professional poker player. Did that from when I was 16 years old until I turned 21. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 19, I was ranked one of the top 10 online no limit holdup players in the world. I was sponsored, uh, traveled around the world, played high six poker games. It was a very uh, sort of unique way to grow up, uh, a very unique adolescence, I'll say. And um, I think I had, I had a lot of experiences that most people don't have until they're, they're much older. Yeah. One of those experiences was, in a way, uh, poker was very similar to crypto in that it was an environment where you, you had a lot of mostly young men who were making a lot of money at a young age uh, doing something that was kind of subversive. You know, kind of uh, counterculture, the kind of thing that they, they didn't quite uh, have the approval of their parents, but they were very successful in life. And uh, it, it, it also, in a way, was, uh, it was it was a somewhat alienating way to make money, right? There are a lot of there are a lot of ways that you can make money that mm -hmm. everyone around you is going to look very impressed, and you're going to end up on the cover of you know articles and books and newspapers or whatever. Um, poker is not one of those ways. There there is a poker subculture, and there are people who you know are yeah. like impressed by poker players but yeah in general it's kind of it's kind of a weird job you know it's 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 something that uh is not universally going to win you accolades and the same thing is true for a lot of folks i know who are now you know crypto traders or you yeah. know they've got some weird kind of hustle in the crypto world um there you know it, it's now a little bit different crypto mm -hmm. i think is you know it's it's kind of gone back and forth in its yeah. status in especially in in the u.s yeah um but you know, when I first got into crypto in the 2017, 2018, 2019 period, yeah. that's when crypto really whipsawed from being, you know, very cool, very interesting, to yeah. then 2018, 2019 being like totally yeah. embarrassing, and the kind of thing that you know a, a normal person would not be caught dead talking about crypto during that period of time. Totally. Um, and so the, the other thing that I learned playing poker at a very young age is um, it was is very obvious that having a lot of money did not make people happy. And you just notice it in the same way that it's, it's hard not to notice when you know all these crypto people, how many people have made a lot of money and they're totally unhappy. And so I, I think the other thing that happened because I was so young is I broke this connection in my mind between money and happiness. It was just very, very obvious that people who are happy, who I knew did not have a lot of money. And the people I knew who had a lot of money were generally unhappy. Hmm. Uh, and, and that was something that I, I carried with me, uh, being, being uh, sort of a, a young adult. Uh, and, and the last thing, of course, is that when, when you're a poker player, you learn a tremendous amount, uh, not about like the, the specific math of how to count cards or how to calculate odds or whatever. Mm -hmm. You learn more, I think the more important and more uh, universal thing is how to think probabilistically. Mm -hmm. And this is something that most people never really quite fully do. Uh, they, may, they may think about probabilities. They may use probabilities when they're thinking about, oh, you know, what's the likelihood it's going to rain or what's the, you know, uh, uh, what's the likelihood that we go into a recession or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but they don't live in the world of probabilities. Mm -hmm. And when you live inside of probabilities, um, what, what, it, what it does is it makes you realize that the way to make correct decisions 
in life is to is to play as though or to live as though probabilities are more real than reality. What, what do I mean by that? When when you're experiencing something that's probabilistic, and almost everything in life is probabilistic on some level, um, when you do something that is right 65% of the time and wrong 35% of the time, most people they uh, they cringe at making those kinds of decisions, right? They will do almost anything to turn that. Uh, that probability distribution into a 90-10 or into a 100-0, even mm -hmm. if on the expected value, meaning that on average, they're actually going to end up getting less or doing mm -hmm. worse, they want to do everything they can to collapse the distribution of probabilities mm -hmm. to make it almost certain that X is going to happen and not Y. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing you learn as a poker player is that you have to get comfortable living in the space of those probabilities, mm -hmm. of those risks, of those uncertainties, because that's where almost all the value is. Like if I'm playing somebody at a poker table and they are forcing a hand to become a 90-10, like they're like, look, I, I want to make it completely obvious whether I'm supposed to call or whether I'm supposed to fold. And mm -hmm. if, if, if it's in some nebulous area in the middle where I don't know exactly what I should do, or like my, my, my hand versus their hand is going to be like some race and I don't want to gamble on it, I'd rather just keep things nice and easy and simple and clean. I'm going to crush that person. They have zero chance of being able to beat me unless they're comfortable living in that space of risk and probabilities. Um, and so you, you, you just start, you get to a point where you, you feel like, even if I lose money in this hand, I know that I made the right decision, even though I lost. Mm -hmm. And most people can never get there. Most people, it, it, it is it's too big of a leap to be able to feel like they made the right decision even though they lost money. Uh, but that's integral to poker. You have to break that connection in your brain in order to become a successful poker player. And that is one thing that I've realized sculpts your appetite for risk and your understanding of uncertainty um, to be very, very, very uh, more nuanced than the average person. And that, uh, more than anything, I think was the most valuable thing that I took away from poker. That's, so. Uh... Uh, that's an awesome framework you've just thrown out there about probabilistic thinking and how that can be applied to so many things in life, not least of which is investing or trading. Um, and we're going to come back to that. But before we do, uh, without making this a pop psychology podcast, I want to delve into a couple of things you said there. Is, um, one is, I guess, about loss, aver loss aversion or risk aversion. People cannot get comfortable with those 65, 35 decisions and I'd love to hear you unpack that a bit more. Why? Why is it that? Why do we, and we all do this, right? Um, you know, we all want that 90-10 or even like got to be a dead cert before we do anything. Why do we like that? And how do people like you break that? Like, was it just, I mean, yes, you were a poker player at a very high level, but, you know, you went into poker. So there must have been some pre-existing conditions that made you, you know, like that um, before poker trained you. So what, what is that, that 90-10 or the I need a dead cert, the loss aversion, the fear? Is it just the way we're conditioned, the culture, et cetera? And the second one is that, that amazing point of happiness. I mean, why are so many of these traders and, and they're not just crypto traders, but traders in general, the, particularly in crypto, I guess crypto is just trading on drugs. It's like drugs, it's like, it's like volatility, it's like the nth degree, right? So uh, um, what, what's this? Can, like, this happiness point, like, is if you make money from trading or money from crypto, why are there so many unhappy people? Is it just the process of making that is just so like nerve wracking? I think if if you look at the research, let me let me take those in yeah. reverse order. Um, let's start with the happiness question. If you look at the research that's been done on happiness, yeah. like the large scale research, the things that you find that are that produce uh, reliable effects. Uh, happiness across populations. The first thing is basically social connectivity. How mm -hmm. close are you with friends, with family, with local communities that are going to keep you yeah. um, kind of level-headed, feel connected, feel like people care yeah. about what you're doing, uh, that what you do is important. Mm -hmm. That is clearly very, very important for people to feel happy and meaning in their lives. Mm -hmm. And the thing about trading is that, you know, trading is not a team sport. Trading is a solo sport. And in mm. general, I think that a good rule of thumb is that 
people who play team sports are happier than people who play solo sports as a kind of loose metaphor, right? Mm -hmm. uh, poker is a solo sport. Poker, you're out there at the poker table, you are playing for yourself. It is your money that you're playing with. Mm -hmm. There is nobody else who cares whether you succeed or fail. And the same thing is, is generally true of a trader who's trading their own account. You know, this is not like, uh, you know, these are not prop shops that people are joining to trade mm -hmm. in crypto. They're, they're trading their own money. Mm -hmm. And so, although they might be participating in a community online, talking with people on, on crypto Twitter or, you know, in some kind of trading group, uh, the reality is that there's nobody else who really cares whether you succeed or fail, except maybe you know your kids or your wife or yeah. your husband or whatever. Yeah. So th that I think has a large part to do with it, is not being integrated into a broader system of meaning mm. uh, when you are out there trading. The second thing, of course, is that trading is a stressful job, right? It's very, mm. um, uh, it, it's it's much like poker in that there are a lot of upswings and downswings, it's, it's highly volatile. And uh, it doesn't give one that uh, sense of continuity and predictability that generally mm -hmm. is uh, associated with, with high levels of happiness. So one of the things that happiness research has, has uh, unearthed about what are reliable ways that people can become unhappy, it's that unpredictability in their lives, right? Not mm -hmm. being, not feeling in control, not feeling like they have a sense of agency over the core uh, things that they're doing. Mm. If, you, if you lose that, it's much harder for you to feel happy. Mm. And uh, I think it, it, trading and poker are, you know, the quintessential examples of high volatility, unpredictable jobs or careers. Um, so that, that would be my, you know, sort of ex ante prediction why I would assume that mm. so many of these folks aren't happy. But the biggest thing to my mind is that, you know, people need to have a sense of what they're doing is important in some way. Yeah, and um, I think you can you can arrest that for some period of time and say, look, you know, right now I just need to make money. Screw it, I don't really care if you know, uh, you know, doing arbitrage on Craigslist is meaningful. I'm making good money doing it, so whatever. Um, but that, that 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 can only last you so long before I think people long for this sense that what they're doing is important. And I think we're we're just fundamentally built that way as human beings. It's hard it's hard to to avoid that. So. Now, going back to the first part of your question, which was about um, the, the risk aversion that most people feel in trading and poker and, mm -hmm. and almost anything, uh, life decisions, uh, and how I arrived at that. You know, when I, when I first started as a poker player, um, I had basically never gambled in my entire life. You know, I was 16 years old when I started playing poker. Uh, I, it was actually my, my first time playing poker uh, was the first time I'd ever interacted with chips, with you know the idea of gambling over a game. It was all completely new to me. You know, the the, the only thing I'd ever played was like you know five card stud with my cousins when I was a kid. Uh, that, that that was my only experience before I you know picked up a hand of poker and started actually playing the game. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it certainly wasn't the case that I was somebody who had this appetite for risk or had this experience with gambling, and that's why I was able to pick this up. I do think there's definitely some element of just genetics of, of how you're disposed to be able to be calm under stress. Um, and I think I'm, I'm definitely somebody who, you know, all things equal, I'm a relatively calm person. And I'm sure that that contributed to my ability to play poker well. But I knew a lot of really great poker players who were hotheads, who had, you know, uh, high emotional sensitivity and they would, they would get angry, they would get worked up, they would get scared. So it's not, it's not the case that in order to get good at poker, to get good at decision making, you have to have you know, low sensitivity or you have to suppress your emotions. And in general, you know, I used to coach poker as well when I was a high six poker player. Uh, I, I would coach other high six poker players. And uh, it, it's generally not the case that, like for the most part, you can't decide to be less emotional. You know, it's just not how it works. Um, you can't, you know, do reps and say, ah, here's, here, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna practice doing things that make me mad and then not getting mad, right? Like, it's not really a thing. Um, the, the thing that you can do mm. is to learn how to notice your emotions. You cannot learn to stop your emotions, right? Mm. The way that you quote unquote stop your emotions is just through experience. Like the more times that you lose a hand of poker, the less you're going to associate it with the strong emotional valence and the more you're just going to get used to it and it's not gonna trigger you much, more, mm. right? In the same way, you know, if you, if you play basketball and you, know, you have a turnover, you know, the first time it happens, it's the most horrible thing that's ever happened to you. 
the thousand times I was like, okay, whatever, it happens, you know, it's basketball. Um, and so that, for the most part, uh, the, the best thing you can do is one, acclimate. So the more that you, you get reps in, the more that you practice taking risks and having negative experiences or negative outcomes and talking yourself through it, the less emotional valence it's gonna have for you. Um, but then second, the more you can learn to notice what you're feeling and just noticing what you're feeling and mm -hmm. having a game plan when you are feeling a certain way, knowing, ah, what should I do when I'm feeling this way? And being able to call into that game plan, right? So, ah, I'm angry. What should I do when I'm angry? Ah, I should step up, step away, take a break, go take a walk, and then go reset myself. That you can absolutely learn to do and modulate your emotions through controlling your behavior rather than controlling your emotions, quote unquote. Controlling your emotions is not a thing. You cannot control your emotions, but you can control your behavior. And that's the most important thing that you learn as a poker player, because emotions, you know, emotions are ineradicable, but they are also the scariest thing to contend with at a poker table, because your emotions are what's going to get you off the game plan. It's what's going to get you gambling for large sums of money. So it's going to get you doing things that you know are stupid. Uh, and mm -hmm. everybody who's a poker player does it. In, in poker, we call it going on tilt. And, uh, you know, the, the term tilt comes from those old pinball machines where like you get really angry at playing the pinball machine and you try to tilt the machine to get the ball to go in. That's called going on tilt. And uh, everybody goes on tilt. But the number one thing is learning, noticing when you are on tilt and noticing that as soon as possible and having a game plan for what you do when you are on tilt to reset yourself and get yourself back into the mode you need to be in order to be playing poker effectively. So that's sort of the, the, the one-on-one to emotional management of poker. Now let's jump from poker to trading in crypto or investing in crypto. Walk us through that journey of going from being one of the top poker players in the world to getting into the world of crypto. I think you said 2016, 17, and then also setting up um, the fund, setting up Dragonfly. Yeah. So after I quit poker, you know, I was 21 when I quit poker. I was a you know, very young man. And I didn't really know what I want to do with my life. Um, I, uh, in school, actually, I studied English and philosophy, nothing technical, uh, nothing useful <laughs> in, the, in, the, uh, in the job market. Um, but eventually, I decided that I wanted to uh, get into the tech industry. You know, I'd always been fascinated mm -hmm. by technology. And, uh, you know, I was a kid who really grew up on the internet. Uh, you know, I grew up in Texas. And in Texas, you know, there's just you know, very, very little intellectual affinity that I found with people around me. Um, and so I, I was really kind of raised on the internet, uh, of internet products. And so the internet was such a fascinating technology to me. It was something in which I, it was so formative in my life, uh, that I wanted nothing more than to be a part of this uh, industry. And so I came out to Silicon Valley, uh, I, I learned how to code and I became a software engineer. I actually took a coding bootcamp in San Francisco called App Academy. Um, I ended up becoming a teacher there for a short time. And then I got a job in the, in the industry at Airbnb, uh, where I worked as a software engineer working on payments fraud. And uh, Airbnb was a, it was a company that was very close to the crypto industry uh, in, in somewhat subtle ways, because Brian Armstrong, the founder of Coinbase, he was actually a software engineer at Airbnb before he left to go co-found Coinbase. And so Coinbase and, and Airbnb always had a kind of affinity as companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and they cooperate a lot. Actually, we, uh, I worked on the payments fraud team. And I remember we had um, this thing that we called Risk Salon, which was uh, a group of the you know, kind of big prominent tech companies like Uber and Airbnb and uh, uh, Coinbase and whatever, you know, a bunch of these big uh, high-flying Silicon Valley startups that uh, got together and sort of shared knowledge and notes about fighting fraud. Um, and one of the very first Risk Salons that I attended was at Coinbase. And Brian Armstrong was there. Uh, as was uh, Supes Ranjan, who, who used to be the head of uh, head of risk at, at uh, he's now the co-founder of Sardine, which is like an anti-fraud crypto startup. Uh, and, so I, I, and so I got to know all those guys. And I learned about what they were doing and I learned about you know, the, what was happening in the crypto industry. And I'd, I'd always known about it at a distance. Um, I think I bought my first Bitcoin in 2015, um, but I, I, it never really completely clicked for me um, until I spent a lot of time with those guys and had a, a much deeper sense of what was happening specifically, not with Bitcoin, but with Ethereum. I think Ethereum was the thing that really um, convinced me that what was happening in 
the crypto industry was going to change the world, was going to change the future of money. And uh, I was just fascinated by it. And I really wanted to be a part of it. And so I ended up leaving Airbnb. Um, I first uh, worked for a little while at a, a startup called 21, which got acquired by Coinbase. That was Balaji's company. Um, became Earn.com and then became Coinbase Earn. Uh, then I started my own startup working on a stable coin uh, until I met this gentleman by the name of Naval Ravikant, uh, who's a very well-known angel investor in Silicon Valley. He's also the founder of AngelList. And he recruited me to one of the very oldest funds in crypto called Metastable Capital. It was founded in 2014. Um, they, at the time, they were managing about half a billion dollars. And he ended up recruiting me to and convinced me to shelve my startup and join Metastable as a GP, uh, as a general partner. And that's where I got my start uh, investing in the crypto. So um, when I was there, you know, I did a bunch of great deals. This is like the, the height of the 2017 market. Uh, you know, we did the seed round of Avalanche, seed round of Near Protocol, uh, seed round of, uh, of Nina. We were early into Algorand, Filecoin. You know, we did a bunch of, a bunch of awesome deals. Um, and it was while I was there that I ended up meeting Bo, who's the other managing partner of Dragonfly. So Dragonfly existed before uh, I, I ended up joining. I, I joined very early in its formation, though. Um, and uh, Bo, he was a, uh, a very large investor in Asia. He's kind of like the Chris Dixon of Asia. He was a seed investor into OKX, which is you know, today the second largest exchange in the world. Um, and uh, we had this idea of building a very different kind of fund together, of trying to build a more, uh, a more global fund than any of the funds that, we, that had preceded us. Right? more global than the Andreessen's, the Polychains, the Paradigms, uh, something that honored the fact that crypto is a global phenomenon, you know? Um, and so I sort of took the DNA that I'd gotten to Medicine, which, you know, highly technical, very deep kind of research-oriented roots, um, and try to combine that with this global perspective that, that Bo brought to the, the investment universe. And that became the genesis of Dragonfly. So that was... Uh, Dragonfly was founded in 2018. I joined in 2019. And um, you know, since then, we've raised uh, a bunch of funds. Our, our latest fund was 650 million that we launched at the beginning of last year. And we invest kind of full stack across the stages uh, from seed all the way to you know, series B, series C. Our check size was anywhere from you know, 2 million all the way to 40 million. Uh, and then uh, the last chapter of that was last year, uh, we also acquired Metastable. Uh, which was previously Naval's fund, uh, and now we manage that as well. So the whole story kind of went full circle. So that's, bring, that's me. I want to bring Garam into the conversation. He can delve more into building the fund and the current fundraising environment and investing environment and so on. And I think he's finished his Jaffa cakes, so I think he can take it. <laughs> me and my Jaffa cakes. It's going to become a. It's going to become a thing. Do not share my address, please, Ronan. No, seriously, Haseeb, thank you so much for sharing your story till now. It's been super interesting. I mean, um, you know, apart from game theory, the poker, probability, everything else, which I'm a big fan of, um, the story of how you basically become a, a GP for the second time round, effectively, you know, in a uh, second fund is, is, is super interesting because the fund model seems to be going through an evolution of itself, you know. Technology investing is, is is not what people used to do in the 60s and 70s and 80s or even the 90s, right? In the pre-dot-com, post-dot-com. Investing has changed, especially in crypto and Web3. It's the outlook, the viewpoint, the returns. It's, it's unbelievable because so much of the condition precedents around which returns or macroeconomics of adoption have changed so drastically. It's, it's, it's a different world. You're not just investing in hardware. You're not just investing in chipsets. You're investing in multiples of returns of money, capital, rails, and infrastructure, right? So, it's, so from that perspective, when, when you first joined Meta, can you take us through that journey? Is there data you can share with us on the, on the Meta stable journey? Um, is it a fund that's completed or is it still ongoing? Because I know you said you acquired it, but a fund cycle typically is anywhere between five and 10 years, depending on the nature of the fund and the aim of the fund, right? Is that fund yeah. complete? And can you share that data with us? Is that public knowledge? So, uh, so Metastable is actually an evergreen fund. So Metastable is structured as a hedge fund. Oh, wow, okay. Which was a very common structure back when crypto funds first began. So the first like crypto venture funds did not show up until probably like 
2016, 2017. Before that, almost all the funds that were doing crypto were these hedge fund structures, where they were hedge funds that would take private investments and put them into side pockets um, and to sort of roll them over once they became liquid into the main fund. So, um, so Metastable, because it's still live, unfortunately, I can't, I can't share um, data about Metastable in a public venue because of public solicitation rules and all this other stuff. Um, sure. But uh, what can you share about the Metastable? That'd be great to, to understand a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the strategy of Metastable, um, which has been the strategy from the beginning, is very simple, which is uh, basically investing into uh, investing into crypto assets that are uh, that, that we believe are going to be valuable in the future or going to be part of the future of this technology, money, whatever. Um, and then second, doing private deals. And those private deals kind of get you know, cordoned off into side pockets until they become liquid and then eventually get liquidated. Um, so it's, it's a very simple strategy. It's the same strategy that's been doing since inception. And that's the same strategy that we uh, kind of took over and are continuing to manage. Um, you know, when I first joined Metastable, I, to be clear, you know, I had uh, zero background in investing or finance or anything, right? So uh, I remember at the time when Naval invited me to come on board to Metastable, uh, I told him like, why, why, I don't know if you know this, but I know absolutely nothing at all about finance or investing or anything. Like I, I, <laughs> this, is, this is completely new to me. Uh, and he's like, oh, it's fine. You know, it's really easy to learn this stuff. Like, don't worry about it. Like, as long as you understand the technology, that's the hard part. The rest of it, investing and term sheets and, you know, deal docs and valuation, I can teach you all that shit. Like, that's not the hard part. Uh, and I was like, huh, okay, that's a, that's a perspective. Um, and so I remember uh, the very first week that I was at Metastable. So, I, I mean, I was, um, I was over the moon. I was so excited that I you know, had gotten this role. Um, but I felt completely and supremely unqualified for everything I was doing. And I remember, you know, Naval, he, um, he, he trusted me quite a lot. Um, and he, at the time we were going through RAA registration, which is basically registering the firm with the SEC, which is a gigantic undertaking. It's very, very, very complex and messy process. And Naval was like, look, um, we're already working on this, but like, I kind of don't trust the people who are doing it. I want you to be, take the lead on, registering us with the SEC. And I was just like, uh, okay, I don't, I don't know. Any, I don't even know what that means, but great. I'm gonna take the lead on this. I'll make sure it gets done. Uh, and so I remember the first week, um, I, was, I was sort of, I, I'd sort of taken a week off, but I was like, okay, I need to like, I need to go to the library, buy as many books as I can about hedge funds and just read through everything. And so I, uh, I bought two books at, at this bookstore. Um, the first one was Hedge Fund Compliance. And I remember it was, it was a big, thick book. And I remember I, uh, I, take, I take a picture of it, just kind of show like, oh, I'm working hard, you know, even though I wake off of, I want to impress my boss, you know? So I, I, I took this picture of this book, Hedge Fund Compliance. Right next to it, which I did not take a picture of, was Hedge Funds for Dummies. Because I, <laughs> I literally did not know what LPs were. I didn't know what the SEC did. I didn't know what Kerry was. I did not know anything. By the way, Ronan knows both those books by heart. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, so all this was uh, really starting from zero in terms of my understanding of this stuff. Um, but luckily, I think Naval was right. Is that um, you know you can you can learn the ins and outs of of the mechanics of investing um, pretty quickly as long as you have folks in the team who are knowledgeable and familiar with it. And that very much continues in my philosophy of how we look for talent. Is you know what I tell people is like, look, I don't care if you can read a term sheet. I don't care if you you know, know what carry is or you know what LPs are. What I care is about your depth of thinking. And if you are, if you have that horsepower, if you have both the, the energy and the intelligence and the, and the drive to become really good at this, then I, I'm not worried at all that you can figure out the mechanics of how to invest. Uh, that's not the hard part. The hard part is judgment. I can't teach you that. I can't give you energy. I can't give you judgment. If you have that, we can mold that into the right direction to make you into a great investor. Um, but without those uh, building blocks, you know, like trade, you know, somebody who just knows a lot about valuation who took classes on finance, that is not the hard part of being a great investor. So it's super interesting. I mean, you, you got thrown into the deep end, but I think the fundamentals of investing are principally the same. You find a lot of angel investors following the same track. They typically tend to invest in what they know. 
Uh, I myself started off not knowing anything about structures around investing, same as you just described, but I knew a lot about operating a fintech business or mechanics or delivering B2B solutions. So I went with that instinct and trusted that the institutions of people I were working with were financially responsible or experienced to put those structures in place effectively to manage SPVs and carry and the rest of it. So I think the fundamentals are always there, right? You, you, mm-hmm. if, and in, again, you described in your background, you had built business or you had learned technology or you had been thrown into the deep end on this ever evolving space. But, you know, a hedge fund is, is, is typically how all those, those funds started in crypto, right? Even Cambrian asset uh, is, is something that I'm, I'm an LP in. And I've been with them since day one. And they, you know, like you had said, had started out exactly the same journey. It was, it was like a bit of nostalgia where they, they weren't investing into companies typically, but they were investing into the, the, you know, the ability of those tokenomics before it was tokenomics, really, in terms of the currencies and, and coins and stable coins, right? Or, and so now, did it evolve from just looking at you know, unit economics into technology rails very quickly? I mean, what happened with Metastable's investment strategy from there? Were you looking at very early stage companies? Were you looking at companies to get a bit a bit mature? Because the space was so young. I mean, yeah. there weren't so many developers. Ronit and I have discussed this before. The ecosystem, even today with developers, is very small. So given the, the, the gigantuan size of how everyone professes it can be, and, and that's also because of the technology stuff. But at that time when you'd started, it was even smaller. That's right. What did you have to go on to say, oh, we, you know, we'll either invest super pre-seed or we'll wait for something to mature? What was the thought process? Yeah, at that time, it, I mean, I came into investing right when the ICO boom was taking off. Ooh. And so there was a there was a big velocity of founders who were launching ICOs, doing, you know, kind of pre-ICO rounds, like that, that was a lot of what we were seeing. And of wow. course, you know, it was, it was, it was full on bull market when I first started investing. And um, it was also very, there was a lot of bullshit. There was a lot of bullshit. And it was, it was also in a way a good training ground for investing because uh, it sort of taught you like, yeah, there is this kind of, you know, 90, 10 rule is that, you know, 90% of everything is nonsense and 10% of it is where the real meat is. And you have to find that 10%. So you have to be very, you, you, you have to get very comfortable saying no a lot, um, but you can't just say no to everything because there is some, uh, some base rate of high quality, thoughtful, innovative projects that you have to find. Um, and so it really is in many ways a numbers game. Um, so we, you know, we, 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 would, we would invest in stuff that was seed, series A, um, we would sometimes buy tokens that were on the open market. Um, you know, so as a, as a hedge fund, we were not actively managed in the sense that, or not actively managed, we were not uh, actively traded. So we, we didn't have high turnover. We were not, you know, getting in and out of positions. You're not high um, frequency everything was volume very period. long. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it was more like buy and hold. So it was very, very long holding periods. So we would decide occasionally, like, ah, we think this thing is really interesting. We're going to build a position in it. And then we would generally hold it for, you know, ideally multiple years. Um, so we, we saw everything and, you know, we saw Avalanche, we saw Oasis, we saw, you know, uh, near protocol, all these things that we invested into early. Um, you know, these were guys who were, who were reaching out to us before they had a white paper, before they had, you know, really anything, uh, solid enough to be able to call a pitch. And they came to us because we were respected technologists and we were able to underwrite the fact that, Hey, these guys are serious people. They're serious technologists. We can help them. We can help them figure out what a market. We can help them figure out distribution, help them hire the, the team that they need in order to get this thing off the ground. Um, and that sort of became the blueprint for how we now do things at Dragonfly. So Dragonfly, you know, we're not um, principally, we're not, we're not solely token investors. We invest both in the tokens and into equity. Um, and in Dragonfly, all of our funds uh, minus Metastable are venture fund structures. So traditional drawdown funds where, you know, you raise, you know, let's say if you raise a hundred million, um, you, you call that hundred million over time to make investments. You don't have the hundred million sitting in a bank account on day one. Um, and so as a result, we find investments over time and we invest into them. We don't just have all the money sitting in Bitcoin or sitting in Ether waiting around to invest. So that, uh, that structure 
means that we invest both into companies like exchanges, brokerages, uh, data companies, uh, all that kind of stuff, as well as investing into early stage, you know, layer ones, layer twos, DeFi protocols, you know, so everything under the sun, as long as it's within the universe of crypto, Dragonfly invests into it one way or another. And we do it, by the way, both in uh, you know, sort of the Anglophone market, the US, Western Europe, Australia, whatever, as well as into Asia, meaning Singapore, uh, you know, Hong Kong, uh, and then you know, to some extent also in the Middle East, where we have a few portfolio companies now that, that have come out of uh, the MENA region. So we invest fairly globally. Uh, and that's also, you know, when I was at Medicine, we didn't really do that. We mostly just invested into things that found their way to the U.S. market. So, you know, it, it, it's very clear that, you know, when you started with Medicine, you had one path that you were following. And clearly the appetite with what you're doing Dragonfly is global, right? That's, I think that's, that is a very clean line as established from your story. When you first started with Ronit to what you just described now. And your fund is six hundred and fifty million dollars. Is that correct? That's the size of the the, the fund. The latest fund, correct. Right, that's the latest fund. So you still are operating a previous fund that still has uh, some time to go for your previous investments to that. So that is this fund two technically? This is fund three. So this our fund, fund one was twenty eighteen. Our fund two was twenty twenty, and then our fund three we launched in twenty twenty two. So those wow. first two funds we are still managing. Um, wow, how big are those? Can you tell us? Yeah, so our fund one was 100 million and our fund two was 250 million. And are those fully deployed? Those are, those are fully deployed, yeah. Oh, fund wow. One fully deployed. That's super quick. That's unheard of. I mean, the uh, fund one took about two and a half years to fully deploy. Wow. So that's, that's, that's pretty standard for a venture vintage to get deployed in you know, two to three years. Mm -hmm. uh, fund two moved much faster. So fund two, we deployed that fund in about uh, a little bit under a year and four months, I believe. Holy. And that was the vintage that everybody was moving fast because that was the 2020 kind of COVID boom vintage. So, you know, that was the, the famous and recent seven month fund uh, yep. where they deployed their 2.2 billion in seven months. Um, so everybody was moving fast in that venture. Wow, just the wow. velocity of I deals mean, and the size of deals was getting really big. You look at everyone over here when you're talking about BC funds, everyone the deploying over a five-year period or a four-year period and then doing the follow-on remainder from the fund <laughs> over the next two to three years. And you guys deployed everything and all it's all gone. The follow-on, everything else, it's all been activated. That's right. That's right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. No wonder there's an appetite at 650 for the, for the third <laughs> There's so much... Well, yeah, I think I, this pace is pretty standard, at least in U.S. venture. I don't know as much about different different markets, um, but generally speaking, most venture funds in the U.S. their investment period is usually three years. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, looking at where you are right now, it looks like then you move very quickly to close this, and you move on to the next one in the next year and a half or two years. If you know, if you take averages out of how quickly you're deploying capital, we, we're right now about half deployed in this fund. So. Okay. Um, which, which, you know, at this point, it's been a year and a half since we closed the initial fund. So we're probably about on pace for a three year deployment cycle for this fund. And you know, you're no longer in the stage where I think you're referring to uh, how to for dummies books anymore. I think uh, you're slightly past that quite clearly. And you have the faith of a number of LPs coming into this ecosystem. Two, two sets of questions and thought that I'd like to navigate through and, and maybe unpackage and unbundle for our, for our listeners. The first uh, train and first compartment that I just want to look at exploring in the structure of, of VC and all, very specifically with what you're doing, which is cutting edge crypto, blockchain, technology, Web3, right, is the kind of LP, the kind of investor that's attracted by that are you looking, do you have individuals or do you have mainly corporates or, or pension funds or what kind of people do you typically approach? And has it been different for fund one, fund two, fund three? I can imagine that for Metastable, it was completely different, but specifically with Dragonfly, one, two, and three, has it been the same LPs consistently reinvesting and deploying capital into you every time? Um or is it completely different people every time? Can you tell us about those LP experiences you've had for one fund one, two, and three? Yeah. So our LP base has evolved 
as the funds have evolved and, and matured and just as the space has matured. So um, Metastable, you know, Metastable of course was the most OG, right? They were like 2014 vintage when Metastable started. And almost all of the investors in Metastable were either individuals, mostly venture capitalists or successful entrepreneurs, um, or there were, there were some funds that also invested like Andreessen and Sequoia and so, and so on that uh, invested into the funds back when crypto was much less accessible. And so they, they, they found the best way to invest to be to invest into these crypto native funds. Um, so that was Metastable. Now, it, when Dragonfly Fund One began, uh, most of the investors were similar in nature. There were some corporates uh, that, that invested into Dragonfly Fund One, but most of the, most of the folks were family offices uh, and then individuals. Fund Two is when things started to pick up a little bit more institutional. Um, but it was still mostly, um, it sort of skewed more corporates, but still mostly family offices and, and corporates. And what about geography? Uh, Can you share with geography a little bit also? Geography was generally split between the US and Asia. So we, we kind of uh, both NLP based in, in, in the US and, and uh, abroad as well, um, mostly in kind of the Hong Kong area where, where you know, Bo has a lot of his connections. Um, and then in our fund three, Fund three is when crypto one, crypto really institutionalized in fund three. Uh, there were just a lot more institutional allocators who were uh, open to investing into crypto at that time. We're back in our fund two and fund one. It just wasn't really the case. Like these guys weren't writing checks into crypto at that time. Um, and, but then second, also just the, the, the size of crypto grew so much that there was capacity for these guys to be able to write large checks where in the past that wasn't really the case. So, um, so you know, I can't disclose individual names, but basically, Come our fund three, we had you know uh, Ivy League endowments, sovereign wealth funds, um, you know much larger you know uh, traditional fund of funds, more institutional players that were able to invest into our um, our funds, and so much more now of our LP base is institutional compared to our fund one and fund two, which were basically not institutional by any means. You know the, the most of our capital initially was families, so we still have family offices, we still have some individuals, but the vast majority of our LP base now has become institutional. And I imagine that if fund one and fund two are already showing returns to investors, your investors in LP base are repeat investors then? Yes, a lot of our LP base uh, you know, re-upped across multiple funds. Yeah, the majority of them have, have continued across all of our funds. So is it possible to talk about the sort of returns that you've been doing? Or is that all private information? Is there Unfortunately, you can't I, just allude? I definitely cannot talk about returns. Uh, not only because they're confidential, but also they, they qualify as advertising if I were to talk about our returns. So that but when you super, look at super no-no. So let's talk about the appetite for returns or access to deals, right? Because when it comes to venture capital, I fully understand and respect the fact that you can't disclose the nature or details about returns, right? But when people invest into funds of those sort of the, the kinds of people you're describing about, whether institutionals and individuals, it's not always about purely looking at the returns on investment, because by nature, it is venture capital it is extremely risky. Typically, funds have a certain track record for liquid or illiquid returns, depending on the structures of those funds. But a lot of people look for access. So when you or knowledge um, into you know, what's happening globally, because you're the best radar, because everyone's coming to you for not only funding, but obviously your knowledge or your connectivity or your own network, right? You or Bo. How many of those percentage wise would you say are looking at more than just a pure return on investment? From your uh, So you're, you're asking, it sounds like how many of investors are strategic rather than financial? Absolutely. Absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, Let me let me let me think for a second. I honestly uh, very few. The vast majority of our LPs are are really financial investors. Uh, that is hyper interesting to me. Yeah, uh, there's. I, I think it was more true in the very very beginning that there were some people who were just curious, kind of putting down some money to learn. Um, and there are a couple of LPs who I, I think. The reason why they invested, they invested, you know, pretty um, kind of token amounts of money, mostly so that they could just build a closer relationship with us. But they're very, they're they're small. Uh, the vast majority of the capital that we have is from folks who are 
for, they're there because they want returns. Let me flip that around. Do you look for strategic LPs? Do you need to um, look for strategic LPs at all? Do you, do you, is there a requirement in your vision of what you're building for either the, the fund three that you had perhaps because it was a built case and you said, listen, I can potentially choose certain yeah. strategic individuals that will understand I will, I'm a better, I believe I'm a better place person for a financial return, but it would be good to have a strategic investor. Did you change that vision after a point or just had good alignment after? I think in our, by the time we got to fund three, um, I think in fund one and fund two, that's the kind of thing that we cared more about because we were really on the up and up and we were trying to build a platform. Um, by our fund three, we already had quite a brand. We had a platform. We had, you know, pretty much the, the connectivity that we wanted, we had. Um, there were a couple situations where we let folks in. Um, we sort of lowered our minimums or, you know, took a much smaller check than we otherwise would because this person was strategically valuable and we wanted to strengthen our relationship with them. Yeah. Um, but it was honestly pretty rare. Uh, it just wasn't as much of a consideration by the time we were at our fund three. Yeah. No, I, I can imagine there are certain funds in New York, for example, that, that did the same for me and they're getting licenses out here to do certain things. Obviously can't name which entities those are, but I understand that perspective. It makes, it makes sense. And again, people do it very few times once they have a brand uh, associated with it. I think that's enough uh, focusing on the first compartment I want to talk about. I want to move very quickly in the interest of time to the, to the second compartment I want to talk about where I think a lot of listeners would be extremely keen to learn more. It's about the deals. Um, you know, and what kind of companies you're looking for to invest in, right? Because a lot of people who would, who would run to this podcast might particularly want to understand what you're looking for, right? That they could apply for in terms of funding. Can you tell us what kind of companies you invest in? What ticket sizes you do? Can you expose that to us? Yeah. So our, our range of investments is very broad. So we write checks anywhere from 2 million all the way up to 40 million. So we can we can go the range and we can back companies all the way until you know they they sort of uh, go onto public markets or or launch their tokens or what have you. The the particular areas that we're interested in they're pretty they're pretty broad. I think you know right now it's it's clear that we're in a in a bear market. Things are relatively quiet. They're not quite as explosive as they were uh, in years past. So most of the time when we're in in a, in a market like this. You know, my, my vantage point is that as an investor, your job is to not be too prescriptive about what needs to happen or what needs to get built, and instead to just pay attention, to sort of keep your eyes and ears open and see where the innovation is happening, where new ideas are being generated. Um, so a, a lot of the, the areas that I am interested in are not so much like, hey, I want to see someone build X, but rather, you know, here are the kind of the broad view, large problems. That I think need to get solved. And I'm interested in seeing people taking angles on trying to solve these big kind of hairy problems that we have in the crypto industry. So just to, just to kind of very broadly uh, brush over them. So one is UX. I think it's very clear the UX in crypto right now is broken and it needs to materially improve in order for us to be able to onboard another order of magnitude of users. Um, and that extends both from the, the ways in which blockchains themselves are interacted with to the, the, you know, the wallets, the on-ramps, you know, all that stuff kind of comes together and even just applications that, that have very uh, you know, painful UXs that, that could be really significantly improved. Um, second thing that we pay a lot of attention to is security. So both security, I mean, there's kind of three layers of security that need to be improved. One is user security. How do you make sure that users don't get hacked, don't lose their funds, don't you know, get their ape stolen or whatever. Uh, the second thing is for contract security. How do you make sure the applications don't get hacked? And then third is chain securities. How do you make sure that the chains themselves are not compromised or you know, their DNS poisoning attacks and all this other craziness that goes on in crypto uh, on a, on a uh, sometimes monthly basis. So uh, security is a big area that still needs a lot of work done. Um, the third area is scalability. So blockchain still need to be more scalable uh, in order for them to be able to, you know, again, expand the next layer out in terms of user adoption and, and, uh, and, uh, and use cases. Um, and so that, that, that's been an area since forever and it continues to be an important area for investment and, and, and research. Um, and so those are, I think, the three biggest categories that we think about. Um, then there's also stuff that's always uh, you know, percolating at the margin, things like real world assets and tokenization. And um, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of areas around market structure that are changing, especially in the wake of FTX. You know, people are rethinking about how exchanges and 
custody and clearing should be maybe separated from each other or, or done differently than they are today. So there, there's a lot of fertile areas of thinking and innovation that are happening. Um, but in a time like this, you know, we, we, we're not gonna say, ah, I know where things are going. We don't. Um, that's why we pay attention to what entrepreneurs are doing, what's working in the market, what's evolving, where are, where's the pump going? That's the question that we ask ourselves every day as investors. Now, if, focusing on the same compartment, I wanna talk about geography a little bit because you mentioned that your LP base and everyone else and the majority of the deals you're doing are United States, North America, and sorry, and Asia as well. But Correct. I'm heavily biased about this region, uh, you know, particularly Dubai and the UAE, Abu Dhabi. So I have to, I have to put this out there and I have to say, so many people we've interviewed who have moved here, come here, and not small, small institutions, they have massive, massive names, founders, companies, so much has happened here so quickly and looks like it has no signs of slowing down. How much are you paying attention to that now or have participated in that you can talk to us about? Do you know in one part you said you invested in some uh, companies and also are you looking to set up an office here or do more work here or have more of your venture partners or associates here? Tell us more about that if you can, please, about the geographies, including this region. <laughs> yeah, so I... I uh... I was there just a couple months ago and I, I tend to spend more time in the region, uh, especially later on this year once I'm back on the road again. Uh, it's, it's clear it's one of the most vibrant areas right now uh, in, in the crypto industry globally. I, when, I, when I rank global cities for their prominence in, in crypto, I would probably put New York number one, Singapore number two, and then Dubai number three. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a really, really vibrant place right now for uh, anybody who wants to kind of be near a center of gravity for crypto innovation and activity. Uh, that said, it's still pretty young. Um, there, there haven't been as many kind of home runs or, or you know, kind of big lodestones around which the industry is forming. But it's very clear the government has taken a very pro-innovation, pro-technology, pro-crypto stance. Uh, and, that's, and, and it's also just situated very well as being the sort of oasis within the region for the, the, the brightest and most ambitious people to end up congregating. Um, and so I think it, it feels like it's still quite early in the development for, for Dubai and for Abu Dhabi as being these kind of um, you know, crypto epicenters, but it's clearly happening. And I think the trajectory I'm, I'm very bullish on. Um, for us personally, you know, having somebody situated in the Middle East would be very difficult because of the fact that we, basically the Middle East is almost exactly on the opposite side of the globe to where we operate. Like we're not a trading firm, right? If you're a trading firm, you want to have 24 seven coverage. Um, as a venture fund, generally speaking, you want to be able to get everybody on the same call to be able to do, a, do an investment committee, right? To be able to, you know, exchange ideas about deals or to, to, to collaborate. And so it ends up becoming, it's one of the reasons why very, very few funds are actually global. It's very, very rare. Most funds, it's like, okay, you've got, a, you've got an Asia fund, or you've got a, you know, a Southeast Asia fund, or you've got a MENA fund, or you've got a US fund. And mostly these funds stay in their own lane. It's very, very rare that funds actually do, you know, kind of expand across multiple continents or time zones. Um, and I think for good reason, right? It, it actually is difficult. And one of the consequences of that is that I work a lot uh, and I have, to, I have to be on call on a lot of time zones that most of my peers who just run US funds, you know, they're off work at five and they, and they you know, don't respond to messages after that point. Um, and that's not how my life works. So it's difficult, it's challenging, it's demanding. Um, but you can do it as long as everybody's willing to put in the sacrifice to, to, to make that work. And so I do think that you can, you can run a fund effectively across you know, the US Europe corridor. And there are a lot of funds that do that. Um, there, there are a few funds that do the US Asia corridor. And, and we do that, you know, mostly you know, kind of situating toward the West Coast where you can make the time zones work. Um, but US MENA is very difficult. Um, you, like, you really kind of need to be adjacent to some degree, I feel, in order to be able to make it work long-term. Um, if you are building out, I mean, this is why you see, you know, for example, Sequoia. You know, Sequoia, they don't have one Sequoia that's across, you know, what do they have? Israel, Southeast Asia, China, India. Um, India. They, they separate them out into separate firms that have their own ICs, that have their own teams, their own investment mandates, their own right. IP bases. Um, and I think that, that is the driving force behind that separation is just the fact that 
you just can't really be one cohesive team when not everybody can be on a call every single week together because of the fact that you know the times are just too disparate. So that's my that's my intuition after having done this for for many years now um, is that you kind of have to pick your span, and I don't think your span as as a venture investor can be the whole world. I think as a hedge fund you can do it, but not not as a venture fund. You need too much. Um, uh, uh, consensus building in order for that to work effectively with folks who you basically never see or have zero overlap with in terms of time zones. Just very quickly, um, I know you had said that, you know, you look at 100% of everything, 90% of things you discard, 10% you have to really focus on when it comes to deals. Correct. But can you tell us more about the volume of deals you're seeing now? Can you Can you describe how much you see annually or can you remember or guide us or give us some insight of what the difference was in the number of deals you saw between fund one two and three because clearly there must be an increase either the number of deals are increasing or that the size of your check size is just increasing amongst fund one two three or is it both so can you tell us more about the the deal flow in volume that's happening or type that's happening yeah so it's definitely the case that it's both uh, our check sizes increase over time, as well as our deal flow and access has increased over time. Part of that is a function of our brand. Uh, part of that is a function of the growth of crypto, is that crypto just grew and the amount of uh, entrepreneurs and companies that were built in the space have grown over the last few years. In the last, call it six to 12 months, things have slowed down, especially since the collapse of FTX, things slowed down quite a bit. Uh, and so we're, we're seeing much lower velocity of deals than we saw last year or the year before. That said, there's still many more deals happening today than happened in 2020 or 2019. So, um, on a if you sort of graph, if you sort of chart the graph, right, it sort of looks like this. But we're you know sort of here now, and below we were you know before we were we were much lower. Um, I, I'd say in terms of the absolute number of deals that we see, it's hard to quantify because not everything do we log. Uh, we only really log things that we find interesting and that we think are important um, to engage with. So, you know, the kinds of things that we're going to actually take a meeting or we're going to, uh, you know, actually get to know the entrepreneur. The vast majority of things that we are sent, uh, you know, we, if, if, you, if you saw our inboxes, you'd see we, we probably get you know, 10, 15 pitches a day. And most of them, vast majority of them, we never meet the founder because we just have no capacity to be able to, you know, process that many pitches in a, in a, in a given day. Um, most of the, uh, the, like the reality is there is that initial filter. Of there, there are a lot of folks who are just, you know, who are not serious or who they're, they're, what they're raising is too small. You know, they're looking for, you know, 200K or, or 500K that they're trying to raise. And, and we just, at our size, we just can't write checks that small. Like it's just not economical for us to be able to manage a 500K uh, check out of a $650 million fund um, because we'd end up with hundreds of positions. Yeah, the unit economics are skewed, skew, correct, for time. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, we just can't devote any time to a, a check that's that small because it's basis points within the fund. Uh, so the, the reality is that the, the, the number of deals that we can actually attend to that fit within our mandate is quite a bit smaller than that. Uh, and then naturally, as an investor, you have, to, you have to prioritize. You have to find the things that you find interesting, that you believe is where value is going to accrue and where you think you have an unfair advantage, and focus your time and energy on those deals. Um, and you're trying to find, you know, the, the the one or two deals in a vintage that end up becoming the big winners. And that really requires a lot of focus and discipline on finding the, the most important areas and the most important founders to uh, pursue, to throw your weight behind and to try to win them over. Last question for me is about the deal club, right? I mean, you said that, you know, you have to use all the unfair advantages you can to get the best kind of deals to invest in. At this point now, there, I know from my own experience that, VCs tend to not operate in a solo capacity. There are always other people on the cap table too of good companies, right? Because they tend to be supportive in more ways than just money. Like the best VCs can do right. much more value add. And that's why people seek them out because if money was just a thing, I don't know, it wouldn't be the same game. It wouldn't be the same kind of field to operate in. Do you find that do you have a certain group of people where you're always on the cap table with? Naturally, you're sharing a lot of deals amongst each other, or is it a is it a market very much that's moving such a pace that what you see and what other VCs see, see it's it's not very collaborative? You know, you just very quickly closed and done. 
or you know is there even room for angels i mean that's my final question to you what are you seeing in in terms of that collaborative space or non-collaborative space and do angels have a chance of even getting a check-in these days yeah so when i first started investing in crypto back in 2017 uh in, in my medicinal days at that time almost every single deal was party round party round means that there's no single lead and kind of everybody gets to jump in and it was everybody gets invited and that was how almost all the big deals in 2017 they were almost all party rounds nobody had had sharp elbows everybody was like oh yeah come on in let's, let's all invest in this thing and um and that really changed after 2018 2019 that's when you started seeing more of these mega funds getting raised people who needed higher ownership requirements and the sharp elbows really started to get developed where party rounds just kind of became a negative signal after 2018 2019 and today uh party rounds generally speaking are a sign that none of the big guys wanted this deal that's usually what a party round indicates uh now that said for when, when you're doing a deal even if you're leading and, you know, mo today most of the time when we do a deal we're generally leading or co-leading um the 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 other investors in the round so generally speaking it's not the case that there's only one investor usually there are also other investors that are brought in generally by the founder the founder usually has the most say and the most and they care the most about who else is in the round um so they'll bring in you know their friends and family they'll bring in some other individual investors who they build a relationship with or who back them early or who they feel like are value adds for the specific thing that they're doing or they're just for signaling reasons right like oh this founder is really really well respected i want them on my cap table not because they're going to do anything for me but just because you know other people will respect me more if they know that this person is investing um so there, there are some folks who we like to bring in the cap tables, but it really depends on what the company needs or what the protocol needs. So if the protocol is something that, you know, they really want uh, to win certain contracts, right? Like they're, maybe, you know, they're, there's some kind of B2B play to what they're doing, then we'll be like, great, you should try to get in your customers on the cap table. So that make it easier for them to build a relationship and close a sale. And so we'll go up and hit up all the people who's on their list of potential uh, customers and we'll try to get them on the cap table. Or, um, you know, if, they, if they're like, look, we really want to be a community play, it's like, okay, who are the community leaders that appeal to the particular cross-section that you're going after? Let's try to get them on the cap table. And so it, it really depends on the specifics of the company. Um, you know, in general, we don't have like a posse that we bring with us into every single deal that we invest into. It's more a function of what is going to, one, make this founder happy, and two, make this company or protocol or whatever it is most likely to succeed. Who, who, who do we want at the table to, uh, to benefit this particular company? That's usually the basis on which we uh, try to construct a cap table. But at the end of the day, it's always up to the company, it's not up to us. So we can suggest things, we can propose different names that we think are uh, better or worse for what they're doing, but ultimately it's their company, not ours. I say thank you so much. That's all from my, my side. All I'm gonna sign off with is saying that uh, I'll never play poker with you, but yeah, it sounds like <laughs> I could invest with you. So, you know, been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Likewise, likewise. <laughs> well, those are really interesting questions from Garo, but I see one last question, and I know this is, let's try to stay away from specific investment advice, but when you talk about the technology, where, where are we in the cycle? And I'm not asking you to like predict the BNB price, which is obviously something's happening today as you record this. Uh, just bigger picture, where are we in the cycle of, uh, is, was this just a you know, zero interest rate, hype play liquidity play are we gonna start seeing real world adoption are we gonna you know fix the um ux problem the security problem where are we in the kind of adoption cycle the big picture question the yeah science. so the the first thing is that you know as an investor um i don't have a crystal ball and that's one thing you learn very quickly investing mm -hmm. in crypto is that nobody knows what's going to happen so it doesn't matter how smart you are how many twitter followers you have how much money you manage nobody knows what's going to happen in the space okay yeah. so the first thing you have to start with is some humility which is that we don't know we're trying to learn as fast as we can we're trying to stay at the vanguard of what's happening in crypto um, crypto is here crypto is adopted there are millions and tens of millions of people who use crypto but it's unevenly distributed today um, that's okay most technologies look that way it takes some time to reach that full penetration um, and it's also not the case that in order for crypto to be valuable that it has to be in every single person's hands right something that's used by 10% of the world 
is still incredibly, incredibly valuable if those 10% of people are using it for something extremely important. Um, so the, the other thing, of course, is that this technology is also very new. So, you know, despite all of the excitement and all the hype and all the, the uh, enthusiasm, you know, NFTs are basically two and a half years old with respect to, you know, the, the, the real full, you know, uh, adoption of this technology. Uh, if you look at Ethereum, it's like, what, seven years old, roughly? Um, still pretty early in its development. Like smart contracts as a serious concept are in the infancy. There's so much more that we have to learn and to do and to build in order for this stuff to really be ready for prime time. So in, in some sense, I'm not worried because of the fact that, you know, uh, th this is just, you know, if you compare this to the dial-up era of the internet, you know, how, how long was the internet kind of trudging around as a sort of weird little academic project that, you know, only researchers used before we had the real mass penetration of the internet as an everyday thing in everybody's lives. Um, now, that's not, that's not to say that crypto will do that. Uh, it's possible that it, it doesn't. It's possible that it plays a very different role in our society and in the lives of people than something like the internet. Um, we just don't know yet. And you can't sit around pretending that you know just because you're confident or because you're in this industry. Um, so it's one of the things that I think I've learned the longer I've been in the space is that your job as an investor is not to know the answer in advance because you don't. And if you convince yourself you do know, you're only gonna make shitty decisions because you, you actually don't know. Um, the second thing is that your job is not to be a permable. Your job is not to assume that everything will go well, that every law will work out in your favor, that every regulation will be good for you, that every day the price is gonna go up. That is also not your job. Your job is to learn as fast as possible and to change your mind as fast as possible. That is what I tell everybody at Dragonfly is the fundamental job of a crypto investor. And you know, in, in, in as much as we are influential in our small way in the industry to be able to push founders, thinkers, uh, builders in the right direction of working on the most important problems and trying to solve them, um, mostly we are on the sidelines. We are just trying to understand what's happening on the field, figure out where things are going and try to be one step ahead of it. So on the whole, my view is that, uh, although you, the answer to your question of, well, was it, uh, was it you know, zero interest rates? Was it a bubble? Was it, uh, is this real innovation? Is this stuff going to really be a part of the financial substrate of the future? My answer to all of that is yes. Yes to all of that. Uh, all these things I think are part of the story of crypto. There is not like, oh, this, this part is not true and this part is true. Mm -hmm. All of it's true. Um, Crypto is a kaleidoscope. It's super complicated. The way that the history books are going to be written about crypto is going to be me a messy story. And that's why uh, we have an edge in investing into it. If it was obvious, if it was easy, if it was, if it was very clear that, ah, this thing is going to be straight up and to the right, then um, you wouldn't need us. You could just have Sequoia do it all. But uh, Sequoia is not going to do it all because <laughs> it's, it's messy and complicated and gross and... Um, uh, it's going to be ugly, and your parents are going to ask you questions. Like, so, you, you, so you, that that is why there's an opportunity for people like me. Um, and uh, and and so I, I take that with grace. Is the fact that um, you know it's not a straight line, uh, and that's why there's opportunity. And so uh, I don't know if that's a, a clear answer, but that's the best answer I've got. That was that was an awesome answer, Hasib. And that's lucky really... right time because that saves saves me from asking you what your parents think about what you do. Given <laughs> <laughs> really you started off as a quote it's highly player, volatile. Yes, it's... it's highly volatile. My parents think about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to host you, Hasib. It was my pleasure. And look us up next time you're in Dubai. Sounds great. We'll do.